So we've finally gotten to that point in the semester where we have, we're ready for our last fundamental principle. <coughs> and this is kind of the last hard thing we're going to do. That, that we're going to do some interesting things after that, but they're not hard. <laughs> um, so this is the, the last kind of challenging thing. And it's challenging because um, it's a little more abstract than some of the some of the other things we've done. Um, <coughs> but really, in form, it looks exactly like the other fundamental principles we've we've used. And so. So one of the one of the thing, the ways we've written fundamental principles is in terms of a quantity at some time in the future is equal to that quantity now plus inputs from the surroundings, and so we can also write it as delta p system plus delta p surroundings equals zero. There, we have lots of ways of writing it. The energy principle looked exactly the same. So the energy in some final state is equal to the energy in some initial state plus inputs from the surroundings, which could be work. It could be energy transferred in as a result of a temperature difference. We'll see that it could be uh, electromagnetic radiation, photons coming in, <coughs> and we can write delta E system plus delta E surroundings equals zero. <coughs> so you have momentum and energy. The third principle, which we're going to talk about today and Tuesday, is called the angular momentum principle. And it looks exactly the same. <coughs> so we have uh, L is the symbol for angular momentum and A is some location which we'll talk about. So the final angular momentum of some system is equal to the initial angular momentum of some system plus inputs from the surroundings which in this case this is a Greek tau and it stands for torque. Um, delta T, and we can write delta ang change in angular momentum of the system plus change in angular momentum of the surroundings equals zero. So, um, so our job today is to understand what angular momentum is, and our job next time is to understand what torque is and how it can change angular momentum. Um, but basically, we're doing exactly the same thing. Now we're back to vectors. So momentum was a vector, energy is a scalar, angular momentum is a vector quantity. So we're back to vectors. Uh, so directions are involved. So our job today is to understand, you know, what ang what angular momentum is, how we can calculate it, uh, and uh, and and why it's important, actually. <coughs> So that's where we're going. And basically the idea is this. So this is um, this is something like a Ferris wheel. So it's going around. And if we look at the blue dot, our, our, uh, the passenger of interest on the Ferris wheel, um, it feels like something here ought to be constant about this motion. So is the momentum of this 
passenger on the Ferris wheel constant. Now the momentum is not constant because the passengers, the direction is changing, right? The magnitude's constant, but the direction is changing. So momentum's not it. So that's not what con what's constant. <coughs> um, the position, that's not constant either, right? That's changing. But something about the relationship between momentum and position relative to the center of this wheel does look constant. So for one thing, the, in this particular example, the angle between these vectors is constant and the magnitude isn't changing. So maybe it's <coughs> some kind of combination of <coughs> position and momentum that actually gives you something that's, that's a constant. And that something is called <coughs> angular momentum. <coughs> um, okay, so... Uh, uh, there is, yes, <coughs> now when things go around, they don't always go around in circles at constant speed. Um, So here's, here's an elliptical, an elliptical orbit, right? And so um, we, can, we can show the momentum of this, whatever it is, comet going around the sun. And we see that not only the direction, but the magnitude are changing. Of course, the, if we consider the, the point, our origin, the point we're going to think about angular momentum around, the, the distance is changing too. Is that, so it's not just the direction, it's the distance. But actually there's a way of combining those two things that does remain constant around that location. <coughs> and again, this thing is called angular momentum. And it's some kind of product, obviously, that's going to be constant. <coughs> so what have we got? Um, so most likely, it's going to include, we want it to include something about the location of this object, the instant relative to some point and something about its momentum and something about the relationship between them. So if we have some position and some momentum, it might involve some function of, of the angle between them. That could be a constant thing. Now it turns out the thing we want, the magnitude, of the angular momentum here is the magnitude of R times the magnitude of P times the sine of the angle theta. But Remember when we talked about angular speed, you asked if, if there was some vector version of it, and the answer was yes, angular velocity. And why is there? Because we need to specify um, the direction this thing is going around. So that's a plane, and our object could be orbiting that way in the plane but it could be going the other way. So we could say clockwise or counterclockwise, but then when we say clockwise or counterclockwise, we have to say with respect to what, what's the plane, so then we have to describe the plane. 
And so the easy way to do that is to use a vector normal to the plane. Uh, and so the convention we choose is that it involves your right hand. And this is a situation today where you're actually going to have to be willing to take your right hand out of your pocket and put down your pencil and wave your right hand around and do things with it to calculate things. <laughs> so basic idea is this. If we, we curl our fingers around in the direction the thing is orbiting, in the plane of the orbit, then we, we call the angular momentum a vector that sticks up perpendicular to that plane, the way your thumb would point. Okay, so what happens if it's going counterclockwise? Try it with try it with your right hand. Yeah, so your thumb ends up pointing down. So the angular momentum in this case would be <coughs> okay. So this is called this is a version of what's called the right hand rule, which you will encounter in this chapter, and then we're going to use it a lot again in E and M next semester. We're talking about magnetic fields and magnetic forces. So it's something we actually, it's useful to know. <coughs> and, um, and so let's, uh, so basically, if we know the way the direction of something is orbiting, we can use our right hand to find what we're calling the direction of its angular momentum. Okay? And this particular angular momentum has two parts. There's angular momentum that's translational, like we talked about translational kinetic energy. There's angular momentum with rotation, which is spinning around on an axis through your center of mass. That's called rotational angular momentum. And we're going to learn to calculate both of these today. <coughs> so let's just um, let's see which one do I want? This one. Okay. So, so let's practice, and we're going to practice today, and the reason we're going to spend so much time practicing this is it's actually important and you actually have to be able to do it, okay? Um, so here we have a planet orbiting a star in a circular orbit in the xy plane. The red arrow shows its momentum. What's the direction of the angular momentum of the planet? The choices are same direction as momentum, opposite to momentum, into the into the wall, out of the wall, or it's zero and it doesn't have a direction. <coughs> okay, and if you're not raising your fingers, what does that mean? <laughs> you couldn't find your right hand. <laughs> okay, yes, thank you. So you're all correct. The answer is four. We curl our fingers in the direction of the orbit. The angular momentum is, is out of the wall. Uh, here we have an actual coordinate system, our usual x, y, z out coordinate system. The planet, this planet, it's a different planet orbiting a different star uh, in the x, y plane. What is the direction of the angular momentum of the planet? <coughs> yes, six. Six is right. So we've got, uh, we curl our fingers that way, our thumb sticks in the minus z direction, okay? So not that much to it so far. <coughs> um, so we need, however, to be able to <coughs> calculate angular momentum 
instantaneously without knowing the full path of something. So we need to be able to calculate the angular momentum at some instant, and that means we need a mathematical way of doing it that doesn't involve knowing a whole trajectory. <coughs> and <coughs> so there's <coughs> what we end up doing mathematically is writing <coughs> ang angular momentum the following way. The angular momentum with respect to location A, what's this location A? Well, we have to draw our, our vector from somewhere. And that's the place we choose as the origin to draw our, our vector. So in, <coughs> in uh, in this example, <coughs> in the examples we saw earlier, what do we think we're going to use as location A, the place we're going to put the tail of the R vector? <coughs> yeah, the middle of the star, right? Usually it's pretty obvious where you want to do this. It isn't always, but... <coughs> so we write the angular momentum around location A, and we specified location A because we could have chosen some other location. Now it's valid to do this, uh, it's not always simple if you choose it some other direction, and we'll, we'll explore that in a minute. <coughs> and this is equal to <coughs> a combination of R and P that's expressed this way. Then this is a new kind, a new vector operation we haven't talked about yet. It's called a vector cross product. <coughs> <coughs> and it has the result is a vector so it's a way remember we we had a we used a vector dot product when we talked about work so work was f dot delta r and that was fx delta x plus fy delta y plus fz delta z and that that was a scalar Well, this results in a vector, <coughs> and it's a way of combining two vectors where the result of the combination is a vector that's perpendicular to both of them. <coughs> now, I uh, saw that, so let's... Um, <coughs> There we go. So here's our Ferris wheel. <coughs> so the angular, so the cyan vector is R, the blue vector is P. And if you just ignore them for a minute and just use your right hand, what's the direction of the angular momentum of this blue object? out of the board, right? Yeah. And so if we say that angular momentum is a vector sticking out of the board, then it is indeed perpendicular to both R and P, which lie in a plane. So R and P define a plane, and angular momentum is in a plane, is, is, a, is a vector perpendicular to that plane. Okay. And <coughs> this is a useful mathematical representation because it actually lets us calculate things fairly easily. <coughs> And there are two ways to actually calculate this out. <coughs> One is uh, to use this full formalism. So if we have uh, R cross P, <coughs> and we're going to call that R sub A actually just to indicate that we, we took A as the place we're going to put the bar. <coughs> it's, it's a vector whose components are the X component. The way to remember this is to think you're doing something sort of circular 
with x, y, and z. So the x component of angular momentum involves the y and z components of R and P. And so the x component is going to be uh, R, Y, P, Z minus R, Z, P, Y. So this is LX. <coughs> And the y component involves the z and x components. <coughs> so this is rz px minus rx pz. So this is L sub y. <coughs> and the z component involves the x and y components, so it's R Z P X minus R sorry R X P Y. Pay attention to what I'm doing here. Minus R Y P X. <coughs> and that sounds like sort of a pain and it is. And um Fortunately, though, GlowScript. <laughs> uh, so if you say cross uh, RP, GlowScript will do all that for you if you give it two vectors. So, yes? Why is it laid out like that? Like, why is it YZ minus uh, ZY for the X, ZX minus? Because it works. <laughs> Um, that is the definition. We'll see. We'll see. So, uh, let's look at... So here is a program that just calculates cross products. Okay, so we have um, a red vector and a green vector that lie in a plane. They define a plane. And this yellow vector is the cross product of red cross green. Now, the order matters. This is not commutative. <coughs> so order, order is important. <coughs> and so we can, if we move the green vector around, we can see the cross product changing. I can make this slightly bigger. <coughs> OK. Um, so, so I'm dragging the, so it looks like when these two vectors are collinear, the cross product seems to be zero. When they're at right angles, the cross product is pretty large. And if they're in the same direction, they're collinear this way, we've got another zero. <coughs> um, it's also the case that, that the magnitude matters. So if the green arrow is small, the cross product is small, and if it's large... Yeah. Do you have a question, Andrew? Uh, so since they're on the... Uh, are they on specifically like an XYZ plane? Or XY plane? Sure, let's call it the XY so plane. Do they have like zero for their z components? They both have zero for their z components. So does that mean like the middle one, the y value would always be zero? Well, it, it means, yes, yeah, so that's an interesting question. So these things are in the xy plane, and so the cross product had better come out in the plus or minus z direction, right? Because that's the only way it could be perpendicular to this plane. Let's see how this works out here. Since, it, as Andrew points out, both of these, the red vector and the green vector, have zero z components. So why is the y component zero? Well, we're multiplying by r sub z here, that's zero. We're multiplying by p sub z here, that's zero. So that gives us a zero. The x component, r y p z, that part's zero. r z p y, that part's zero. So in fact, the only non-zero piece is going to be in the z direction. Now, if you're doing an actual calculation, yeah, just a second, Elliot. So
So if you're doing an actual calculation, sometimes it's just really easy to use your right hand to decide. <laughs> your right hand and figure out it's going to be on the z-axis. Then you could say, well, I probably don't need to do this. All I really <laughs> need to do is that. Yes, Aaliyah. What? Are the x and y components of the angular momentum going to be zero for everything? There, no, the x and y are the x and y components of angular momentum always going to be zero? No. Because it depends on the plane in which P and R lie. So, for example, if we had <coughs> something going around in a circle in the xz plane, okay, what's the direction of, what are the possible directions of angular momentum? Negative y is one, positive y is the other, right? So, so the only thing we can say is that angular momentum is going to be perpendicular to the plane defined by r and p. And if we're asking you to, to draw something, uh, it's almost impossible without a computer to draw in 3D, so very probably we're going to constrain things to either the XY plane or the YZ or the, the XZ plane just so you have half a chance of, of drawing something. Um, <coughs> but in, in general, I mean, things orbit in lots of different planes, and so in general, angular momentum can be in any direction, and all we're going <coughs> to, all we could say is that it's going to be. Um, so, okay, so there's another way to, c to determine this vector, which is to say that the magnitude of L sub A is the magnitude of R times the magnitude of P times the sine of theta, and then we get the direction, uh, with another version of the right hand rule, which is our other, what is our other version of the right hand rule? Uh, um, so to get the direction of a cross product when you don't have a whole trajectory to curl your fingers around, there's a procedure to do, so you put R and P tail to tail as if you were going to subtract them, but you're not. And then you align <coughs> fingers with R. Why R? Because it's, it's the first vector in the cross product. Okay, and right now the only cross product we care about is R cross P, so R is always going to be the first vector in the cross product. <coughs> and we do this, um, we do this with a karate wrist, okay? Mm -hmm. So no, no floppy wrists, okay? We're going to align our fingers like this. <coughs> so, so here are, um, here's some vector R. <coughs> Here's some vector P. Uh, the first thing we do is we have to put them tail to tail. So we'll move P so it's here. We've aligned our, our hand, our fingers with R. And then we're just going to fold our fingers toward P. Now this is where the karate wrist comes on. Because the way I've got my hand right now, I can't do it without breaking my fingers. <laughs> so I have to rotate my hand over so that I could actually do that. Basically what we're doing is we're curling through the, the smaller angle, right? Okay. So we, we fold our fingers toward P. <coughs> so noting noting that we may have to rotate our wrist and that's important and then we just stick our thumb out and our thumb gives us the direction of
of angular momentum. So here we align fingers with R, fold toward P, thumb sticks out, direction. And which, which method is easier to use um, actually depends on what information you've got. So if you have components, you're going to do it this way. If you have magnitudes and angles, you're going to do it that way. You have to be able to do this right hand rule anyway because by the time you're done with this, you really want to check and make sure you've got it in a reasonable direction. Um, so, so being willing to put your pencil down if you're right-handed uh, and, and take your right hand out and use it is actually important. So let's, <coughs> let's practice a little bit here. Now notice that each of these vectors has only one non-zero component, so our life is a little simpler than it might be. But what I'd suggest doing is, the way I do this is just to try to visualize them on a 3D coordinate system. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. You had, well, you don't need the, so we're, we're doing this instantaneous calculation, so we don't even need, we don't really necessarily need to imagine going around this, although we could. Um, <coughs> okay, so what, what is the direction? And, and there are various different ways to do this. You can use your right hand, you can look at what's gonna come out of that. <coughs> Okay, well, we're getting a variety of answers. <coughs> so, um, so let's see. Let's just do the right hand thing. So, the first vector is in the plus z direction. So, I want to stick my fingers out of the board. Right? And the second vector is in the plus y direction. So I'm going to fold my fingers up toward plus y. That means my thumb sticks out that way, which is indeed negative x, isn't it? So, so 2 is the correct answer. It's, it's negative x. <coughs> and let's check it here. <coughs> so we know that, that these two vectors, this is the yz plane, basically. So we know it's going to be plus or minus x. These two vectors lie in the, and so, uh, so let's look here. R y is uh, zero. Uh, R z is not zero, and P y is not zero. So those two things together, and then there's this minus sign. So in fact, negative x. Okay, so there's a variety of consistency checks. <coughs> what about this one? Okay, I see that using fingers for this is maybe not the best solution because people are still waving their hands around doing calculations. But, 
but yes, most of you are saying one, and that's correct. So we have the first vector is in the plus y direction. The second vector is plus z. My thumb does indeed stick out plus x direction. OK, yes? Well, because that's our it's a right-handed coordinate system, so we have x, y, z out of the board. That's our standard. Yeah. So we always use a right-handed coordinate system. <coughs> okay. Questions? All right. Um, so. So let's just let's just do a couple calculations. <coughs> Quickly. So, um, and we'll use both methods here to do this. So we have a vector P that way. We have a vector R that way. This is location A. This is 30 degrees. The magnitude of P is 20 kilogram meters per second. The magnitude of R is 5 meters. <coughs> What's the angular momentum of this object? Well, we want the angular momentum as a vector, but we can get magnitude and direction separately and put it together in the end, right? And since we know an angle and we know uh, magnitudes, it seems like that's what we want to do in this case. <coughs> so the magnitude of L is going to be the magnitude of R magnitude of P sine of theta. Now the question is we know this angle is 30 degrees but that's not the angle we need is it? So what's the angle between R and P? We'd have to put them tail to tail. So if we just move R up here we see that that angle is also 30 degrees. Okay, so the angle really is 30. So we have we have five meters, 20 kilogram meters per second. Sine of theta is point. Sine of 30 degrees is 0.5. So. Uh, 50, right? <coughs> 50, what are the units here? Yep, kilogram meters squared per second. <coughs> now what's the direction of the angular momentum? We're not done yet. Plus C, so by the right hand rule. So L A is zero zero fifty kilogram meters squared per second. <coughs> right? <coughs> okay. <coughs> Suppose we have <coughs> no 
momentum is 0, 0.30, 0 kilogram meters per second. R is negative 5, 0, 0 meters. What's the angular momentum? So I'll write this I'll write this back up here. Oh, that's not, yes, sorry, because there's a three there. Thank you. You're supposed to catch that. <laughs> Specifically you. Okay, so, so first of all, before we get into calculations, what should the direction be? <coughs> is it z or minus? So it's it's if this is the xy plane, then it's going to be plus or minus z, right? Is it plus z or minus z? Minus. Really? <laughs> well, let's see. <coughs> R cross p, yeah, minus z. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we better. So, <clears throat> okay, now the Z component is going to be PXRY minus, <clears throat> so PX is 0 and RY is 3 minus PY, which is 30 times... <clears throat> Sorry, RxPy, you're absolutely right. Minus 5 times 30 minus Px times Ry. So that's 0, 0, minus 15 kilogram meter squared per... 150. Okay, I could actually look at what I have written here instead of trying to do it in my head and that would work better, wouldn't it? Okay, so, so you can do this. Now, interestingly enough, <coughs> we have time for this, yes. <coughs> it's actually possible to calculate the angular momentum of something that's going in a straight line. because we apply this definition <coughs> so here's a ball falling straight down here's location A <coughs> what's the direction of the ball's angular momentum with respect to location A Down, down, boom. 
Okay, so what's the direction? Never mind, never mind the straight line thing, just here's location A. Think about R, think about P. <coughs> Well, let's let's draw the picture here. <coughs> okay, we agree that we agree that P is this way, right? Here's location A. How do I draw R? Okay. What's the direction of R cross P? <coughs> so here's. So here's, we put them tail to tail, so we'll put R here, R cross P, negative Z. <laughs> you know, the XY plane isn't that hard because you can draw it on a piece of paper, right? So I mean, you can just go, or we could put, alternatively, if you want to move P down here, we can go R cross P, Okay, so don't, don't try to weasel your way out of the definition. I mean, it, it's, yes, it's going in a straight line, but it looks like it has angular momentum that's going to be equal to <coughs> magnitude of R, magnitude of P, <laughs> sine of whatever that angle is. Right? I mean, you can't get out of that, right? Well, does that make any sense? Well, it turns out it might. Um, so let's consider this situation. <coughs> so we've got a, a device that consists of a bunch of balls on the ends of some spokes. <coughs> and it can rotate around its center, right? So if it was turning, it would have some angular momentum. And that little lump up there is a ball of clay. And we're going to drop it, and it's going to hit one of those, going hit to hit this bicycle wheel thing, OK? <clears throat> OK, well, now it's pretty clear that this thing has some angular speed and will We'll see that that means it's, we can calculate its angular momentum. So one way to analyze this situation is to take both objects as the system and say the ball had some angular momentum before it hit the, the, the device, and now the device plus ball has, like, has that same amount of angular momentum. And <coughs> and it kind of depends on where we drop the ball. So if it's if it hits a little closer to the center, it spins a little slower. But if it hits there, it doesn't do anything. <coughs> if it hits over here, of course, it makes it turn the other way. If it hits over here, it makes it turn clockwise faster. So in some sense, it actually does make sense to say that the falling ball here has non-zero angular momentum with respect to the center of this wheel device. So R cross P would be out of the board, and it can transfer that angular momentum to this device. So. We'll, we'll explore that more later, but it's not completely insane to say that an object traveling in a straight line has angular momentum with respect to some location. Now, in that situation where it just falls straight on, it gave zero angular momentum to the, the sp wheel and spoke thing. But what was its initial angular momentum relative, relative to location A? <coughs> so here's, here's location A. Here's P. How do I draw R? 
So R goes that way. So what's R cross P in this case? Zero. Zero. So. so we'll see that this sounds very formal, but it in fact does have some, some significance. <coughs> okay, we can calculate angular momentum. And the kind of angular momentum we've been calculating so far is, is called translational angular momentum because uh, it has to do with, with moving, sort of orbiting around some location. Um, in fact, if you're taking PCAM, which I know some of you are, you may be talking about spin and orbit, angular, spin and orbital angular momentum. This is the orbital kind where electron is traveling around the nucleus, for example. So this is, so another word for this is orbital angular momentum. Um, <coughs> but things can just rotate around their centers as we saw here, and so we'd like to be able to calculate the angular momentum of something rotating on its center. <coughs> and so if we think about something like a solid hoop of metal, rotating around its center. It's got extremely low mass spokes connecting it to an axle and we're not going to worry about their mass. So we're going to say all the mass is in the, like a bicycle wheel or something. <coughs> and it's spinning around its center. How would we calculate its angular momentum? Well, one way to do it is just to say Let's take one piece, and we'll calculate the angular momentum of that piece, and then we can add up the angular momentum of every piece and get, making sure they're all in the same direction, and get the total angular momentum of this moving thing. So, let's say it's moving this way. <coughs> Unsurprisingly, we're going to take our location A at the center of the wheel, because rotating the center of mass, if we're, if we're talking about rotation around some object, it's rotating around an axis that goes through its center of mass. <coughs> so we've got R and P, and so the angular momentum of one piece is the mass of this piece times the speed of this piece uh, that's, so we want R, so the magnitude of R. We want MV, we want sine of theta. What's theta in this case? This is a wheel. 90 degrees, isn't it? Yeah, 90 degrees. <coughs> so, so sine of theta is one. So this is the radius of the wheel. This is the mass of one piece. So let's say we have 20 pieces. And it has a total mass of m. So this is m over 20. And its speed, remember that we can talk about the, the speed of something going around, it's equal to the, it was equal to the angular speed times the radius. <coughs> so this is the magnitude. <coughs> and that looks like <coughs> 1 20th m r squared omega for one piece. And so for the whole thing, we'd add up 20 of those because <coughs> the angular momentum of this piece is going to be in the same direction as the angular momentum of that piece, the angular momentum of that piece, right? <coughs> so L total <coughs> is 20 times 1 20th times mr squared omega and that's equal just to uh, 
<coughs> this is the rotational angular momentum. And what is MR squared? Do you remember what that ended? What does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's the moment of inertia of this hoop because the the moment of inertia was defined as <coughs> the sum of M1 R1 squared plus. So the rotational angular momentum is actually turns out to be equal to I times the angular speed and we can write this as a vector if we just get make angular speed turn angular speed into angular velocity it's a vector in the direction defined by the right hand rule and this is general uh, it's worked out in the book for an object made of lots of little pieces. So this is this is this is a general equation. Yes, Flavio. Well, I just chose twenty, but in general, we could just say um, that's m over n. So if we have n pieces. <coughs> So n pieces times one over n. So I mean, if which is how we yes, Charles. Moment of inertia depends on the shape, and the the we're not gonna we're not gonna spend a lot of time calculating moments of inertia because it's basically just an, a mathematical exercise. Um, so, for example, in recitation when we solve problems or on a test, you will be given moments of inertia, but it depends. The key is that this um, this this R and this expression here in moment of inertia. This is a perpendicular distance, so it's a distance to the axis around which it's rotating. So if we have a sphere, for example, and we're adding up all the pieces of the sphere, what goes into our sum is the, the distance from that piece to the axis, not to the center of the sphere. So that's a perpendicular distance. <coughs> Somebody else had a question, Robert. Oh, we just we just use the finite sum, but in, in many cases you can you can transform that into an integral and 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 do it, and that's how you're going to get these algebraic expressions for moments of inertia. Um, and you can amuse yourself by by doing that. I'm sure you can find on on the web various illustrations of that. But it's not physics; it's just math. <laughs> and so I we don't care very much about actually practicing doing that we care about applying physics principles and so that's a little bit of a distraction other questions <coughs> okay so um, so in general uh, <coughs> the angular momentum uh, of some system, the total angular momentum it, about location A is going to be the sum of two things. The translational angular momentum plus the rotational angular momentum around the center of mass. And that's going to end up being so one of the things we'll do this afternoon is calculate two pieces of the angular momentum of the Earth with respect to the Sun, for example. <coughs>